I'm a feminist, but when a guy recently asked for my number, I decided to use the excuse, I've got a boyfriend. Because I finally got a boyfriend, and I'm really proud of that. And I wanted him to know. (laughs) Thank you. I'm a feminist, but when I watched Baychella, I thought... It's wonderful that a black woman has finally headlined Coachella. But mainly, I thought, this is amazing representation for women with thighs. (laughs) Yes. It's true. If you are a woman off hip and thigh, that has done so much for you. Yeah. That has done... Yeah. Yes. What that means, we can all wear cut-offs now. Mm. And people (laughs) will... I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay, all right. (laughs) I'm joking. Where were you like... Sure. I mean, I'm not going to, but I like the option. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but earlier today when I had an interview about the intersections of racism and sexism, all I could think about was the fact that I wanted to be at Coachella hanging out with Rihanna and um, Beyonce, who are my best friends, and I didn't want to be there. (laughs) That's bad, isn't it? Do you reckon, though, if, (laughs) say, Kelly had an accident... (laughs) you could just step in at the last minute to be in Destiny's Child. No one would notice. (laughs) Do you think that? Do you ever think things like that? Do you ever think, if, say I was at Wimbledon and I was in the audience, and then Maria, well, I'd Chaparova, somebody like that. Sharapova. Sharapova, thank you. Doesn't bode well for me that I don't know the name of a very famous tennis player. I'm not going to be first picked. But if they said, oh, she's fallen over, can anyone understudy for her? I'm sure that's not how tennis works. Understudy? There's a little bit of me. There's a little bit of me that thinks, yeah, I could do it. But I, I think I could. Who do you want? Okay, I, I'm going to admit this now. I'm a feminist, but I, I primarily watch the Oscars for the dresses. <laughs> it dawned on me this year because I was in L.A., which meant that I didn't have to stay up to bum fuck o'clock to watch <laughs> some fucking fuck thing that I didn't give a fuck about. Bear in but, mind, if you're listening at the Academy, Susan McComber would oh like gosh. an Oscar at some point. <laughs> she would love one of your shiny Academy Awards. And when she goes on stage, that will not be her acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> What she won't come out to be like, oh my God, best supporting actress, Susan McComber. And then out you come... Uh, what's great about this being in LA is uh, I haven't had to stay up till bum fuck o'clock <laughs> to accept this little fucker, whatever the fuck he is, some fucking thing that I don't even fucking want. But check this fucking dress, man. Check this dress. I'll tell you what, a team of men came to my hotel room six this morning. They've been pouring me into this since then. Just check the fucking dress. Uh, That's who, what I would who, do. Who, are you, who will you be wearing, Susan McComb, when um, you go to the what office? What do they all wear? Oscar de la Renta. I, listen. <laughs> as as long as you don't what say... What are you wearing? Oscar de la Renta. They all say that, innit? That's uh, the one that they all wear. As long as you don't say bum fucking Gabbana. <laughs> bum fucking... Bum fucking top shop. <laughs> I dare you to wear top shop to the Oscars. I would love that. I, I think that's will. the coolest. I, I will. I, I think that's, that's the fucking coolest, option. man. I think that's the coolest. Do you know... <laughs> Do you know the coolest thing I ever saw at the Oscars? Okay. Hugh Grant, there's a clip of Hugh Grant. I think it was around the four weddings time and he was there and they said, who are you wearing? And he looked down and he went, oh, um, I borrowed this dinner jacket from a chap at Oxford. I think he still wants it back. <laughs> Sweet, Hugh Grant. Sweet. Straight white posh man, we salute you. <clears throat> I'm a feminist, but if I bumped into John Hamm... In a dark bar, while I was casually over in Los Angeles having some meetings. And he said to me, "Uh, excuse me, um, (laughs) this is going to sound silly, but are you uh, Deborah from The Guilty Feminist? (laughs) And I said, yes. (laughs) And he went, people keep sending me your podcast because um, you keep mentioning me. (laughs) And I was like, oh... John Hamm, sorry, I'm sorry, I, I'll can, I can stop. I can, I'll do George Clooney, I'll fill in with George Clooney or someone else. And he went, no, I kind of like it. <laughs> and I went, oh, well, I could do more, so I'll probably, I'll probably make this one. 
do you want to make it a little longer? <laughs> and I went, yeah, 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 sure. Shall we go for dinner? And he said, I, I'm not interested in dinner. And I said, what, what are you interested in, John Hamm? And he said... <laughs> and he said... Well, uh, I live right on uh, Magnolia Drive. And I said, wow, that's one of the only street names I know in LA. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, do you want to uh, come back with me? And I said, you just because I have a new hot tub and I haven't tried it out. And I was like, sure, because women with thighs are in now. Uh, <laughs> and then I got in his sports car and... We drove open top down, breeze in our hair. He just had like some sunglasses on and he was just like, not really looking at me, but occasionally I'd catch his eye in the rearview mirror. And then we pulled into the driveway of this amazing mansion. And then we went in and he directed me round to the hot tub where he had an array of appropriate bathing suits. And I put on one that I felt pretty confident in, and then got in the hot tub while he was getting the champagne, and then he came out and uh, popped the champagne, and we sat there, and we talked for hours. Like, we talked for hours, Susie. Like, we'd known each other forever, but also had never met and weren't meant to until this very moment. And our eyes were really connected, and then he went, uh, I, um, I have a little suggestion. And I was like, sure, and then but we'd need to take it inside. I was like, sure, well, I'm getting cold, so that's fine. <laughs> and then we went inside, and then he said, would it be too forward for me to ask if we could be intimate? And, I was, and, I, and, and if I were like, no, no, it wouldn't be too forward. And then he said, would you be open to wearing this? And he went into the bedroom, came back out with a red dress and a white hood. And he was wearing like a madman suit, but really it was a it, it was a husband suit. And he said, "Put this on, off John." And then he said, I need you to meet my current girlfriend. And she came out in a green dress. I would say, may the Lord open. Susan McComa, and very special guests, Nick Francis Cornerbear and Yasmin Abdul Majid, talking about identity. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Um, <laughs> You had a, have you had a, you, it's, it's been a while. We did, we did a sneaky one at the BFI, but it's been we a while because you've been in Los Angeles. Oh, yes. I Selling mean, my soul. Yeah. And did you get an option on your soul or how did no, it No, no one wanted it. <laughs> There'll be more like that. <laughs> It'll be that kind of gold. All night, gang. All night. All night. Are you feeling in a feminist place? Um, yeah, I am. Super. Loads. <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah, it's, no, I am super. I feel like there's a lot to be feminist about at the moment. There is a lot. It's a time, isn't it, where you just... Every four minutes when you look at Twitter, there's a new thing to be angry about. Yeah, you sort of go, oh, OK, cool, we're doing... Oh, no, here we go, something else. Oh, no, relax. Oh, like, for me, watching Beyoncé last night for two hours, I was like, yes, yes, oh, my gosh. And then within minutes, I checked Twitter, and I was like, oh, the fight is still there. Yeah. It's really depressing. That's what I find as well. To be honest, I'm creating a liberal bubble of my own making where most rooms feel like this. So I forget there are rooms that don't feel like this. There are so many rooms that don't feel like this. 
Um, so we're talking about identity today. Identity. Mm-hmm. And like how we feel about ourselves and how we're represented uh, in the wider world. How we feel when our sort of personal identity gets mixed in with other gender politics identities or people's assumptions and projections of us. How do you feel about your identity, Susie? <sighs> Do you know, I'm starting to feel, actually, the older I get, the more I'm just like, oh, well, I'm here, aren't I? I've woken up. <laughs> I've, I've put on some socks first. Always. Do you? No. Um, that was a joke. I don't, no, I just thought, funny, man. for imagine, I was, wi- I was me waking I was, up and just going, socks. I was imagining you naked and then just of going course. for the socks, and I thought, it's not unlikely that Susan McCormick would do that. <laughs> It's not unlikely. I just kind of feel like sometimes it's just you give yourself... Basically, I give myself treats over very little things now. So waking up, um, (laughs) (laughs) going to the toilet, uh, smiling. I'll remember to smile on my nice one. Cake. I'll get like a a slice of cake. A little cake. A little bit of cake. Um, Do you know what I mean? I'd be much kinder to myself when it comes... Because I think that there is so much, particularly as a daughter of uh, two immigrants coming to this <laughs> nation um, it's really hard and I gave myself yeah. a really hard time about trying to sort of figure it out and I think the older I've become I've just sort of left myself alone a bit mm. I think I so know it's exactly what you problem. mean because it's a lot isn't it it's a lot because you have to be much. proactively fighting racism mm-hmm. sexism and also ploughing your career it's quite boring. as an individual woman. Yeah. And yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot it's on really your plate every single day to have to get up and do that. Yeah. So I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So, I, mm. I genuinely think I might be finally caring less about what other people think. Really? It's, it's like putting luggage down. But here's the thing with putting things down. Talk to this me. is how I feel about my baggage. Okay. I do a big clear out. You know, I do mindfulness. I go to therapy. I really think it through. I decide, make some decisions. I make positive decisions. I start doing different things. I do yoga, blah, 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 blah. And it's like taking my emotional baggage to Oxfam and saying, like the shop, the charity shop, not just phoning Oxfam, the charity, and saying, I know, I know you've got issues in Africa. <laughs> but Help me out. I am having a North London dinner party and I'm really stressed about it. And where's my Amnesty International? Um, not that. I mean, like down, to, down to a charity shop. Down to, let's say, a charity shop. It's like I take my emotional baggage and I take it down to a charity shop, and I think, I drop it off, and I think, I don't need this anymore, I've cleared it out. And then I come home, and it's in my living room again. The same bags, with exactly the same old clothes that don't fit me, that I don't want, that are out of date, some of them aren't even mine, I don't know where they've come from, some of them are men's clothes, and I'm looking through the bag, and I'm going, why are these here again? I got rid of them, so I take them back down Mm. to the charity shop, Mm. come home, they're there again. (gasps) That's a horrible, like, recurring nightmare. Yeah, it's like a horror film. But for emotional baggage. I need to be clear, this isn't literal. No one is breaking into my home. It's that feeling. Somebody Does from Oxfam is going, she's bringing her shit again. <laughs> Break into no. her home and give it back and add these massive trousers. Yeah. Because she's a really annoying bitch. Yeah. Genuinely, that's what it's like. Does anybody else feel this? That you think you've sorted through something and then it just comes back worse? A lot of things are tied up in our identity. It's your personal self. It's your personal growth. It's how much you've changed. It's how much you manufacture and construct who you are. Mm -hmm. I think we worry about authenticity too much. And I think authenticity is very limiting. Yeah. Because... And also it changes. Yes. Your authentic self. Like, you don't want to stay the same. I don't want to stay the same. Although I think I'm the same as I was when I was 14. I think there's been no growth. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think you're pretty much the same. But no, you do, but, you know, stay in your, stay, stay your, your authentic self, love yourself. Like, that's a life's mission, mm. I think. Well, you said to me once, when people say, live your best life, you think, I'm trying. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so we, were talking, me, we were talking about black girl magic. So, when, oh. so it's, um, you, you may have seen the hashtag about black girl magic, <laughs> Beyonce. Um, and, it's a, you know, it's a really positive hashtag statement about black women despite everything that is up against black women, they're still brilliant and wonderful and achieving great things. And it's great. But also, in, it's limiting as well, because sometimes I feel shit, and I think that it's important to be able to feel shit and not feel magical. That's human as well, rather than, you know what, somebody was racist to my face yesterday, and I just look amazing with this highlighter. It's like, no, <laughs> racism makes me really fucking angry, and I don't want to smile, and I don't want to get out of bed some days except for um, when I found my socks, and then I give myself a little pack on the back and I have some cake. Yeah, sure. But um, 
but yeah, no, I do feel like sometimes you just need to go, do you know what, today I'm really pissed off and I'm really angry. Naming your pain, I'm a very big fan of that. And not always trying to have to make yourself feel better because it's part of our identity, the sadness and the anger, it's part of who we are. Mm-hmm. And we've got to own it, suppressing it, suppressing it, suppressing it is in fact, I think, taking a leaf out of the toxic masculinity book. Exactly. But still, some days a little black girl magic probably doesn't go straight. Every day. Everybody in the house, put your hands together for the amazing Deborah Francis White! At Christmas, a two-year-old came around to the house where I was staying, a little girl, very sweet, and she did that thing that small children do, where they give every grown-up in the room one of their toys, and then they come around and take it back again, which is rude. (laughs) You don't know where you are with two-year-olds, do you? They just like... She gave me this sweet little dog, and I thought, oh, that'll be nice for my desk, and I put it in my handbag. (laughs) And then she came back and went... It's the dog. It's like, you just gave it to me. She was like, well, it was a loan. And I was like, you need to be more specific. My handbag is like the British Museum. Um, <laughs> got a number of marbles in here. This has happened before. Um, but I didn't know what they were. This was Christmas, and I, I didn't know what they were. And the parents saying, oh, this is Paw Patrol. She's obsessed with Paw Patrol. And it turns out every toddler in the world is obsessed with Paw Patrol. If you go on Lin-Manuel Miranda's Twitter account, he's always singing the Paw Patrol song to please his son or take him to a live show. And it's endemic. There are nine characters in Paw Patrol. So I guess how many female characters would there be for this little girl to feel represented and to think, oh, yeah, I can do that. There's the, 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 just to be clear... The dogs with jobs. I need to be clear about that. <laughs> the dogs with jobs, like police, officer, fire, fighter, that kind of thing. What balance would you think? I mean, it's not going to be 50-50. And there's nine, so nine. Nine. What, what would you guess? What would you guess? One. Two? You're guessing two? What would you guess? One. Three. Nine. There was one at that time. There was one. So there's a little boy who takes the Paw Patrol dogs out and goes, oh, there's a problem, oh, there's a fire or a disaster of some sort. And then he takes out dogs that are called things like Chase or, I don't know, Go Get Em. And uh, (laughs) not the real names. I think one of them might be called Chase. I think the cop dog is called Chase. And then, do you know about this? Do you have a small child? Yeah, I have a nephew. You have a nephew. Okay, great. Can you fill in any of the other names? Marshall. Marshall. Marshall, because he's a fire marshal. Rubble, because he's... What does he do? Break rocks. Builder. Okay. All of these dogs have jobs, and they've all got uniforms and recognisable jobs that you'd know, except for one girl dog who's a labra fucking doodle (laughs) and her name's Sky, and this is how she talks. All the other dogs have normal voices, dog voices, the sort of voices you'd expect from a fire chief dog. That... (laughs) Oh, going to fight a fire. Oh, you've got a fire for me to put out. Canadian, but get, fit, get, get, get the idea. And then you get, Sky, I've got to go up into the sky. And she's got some kind of, I don't know, wings in her back or something. And she goes up and she goes, I can see things from here and that's not very helpful, but, you know, one day I might be able to chip in. And, and you're looking at it and you're going, this is what our children who can't even talk are being dished up. She can't even talk. And these are her favourite toys. I know that because she made sure she got every single one back. <laughs> And the parent said she's absolutely obsessed. And what she sees is that there are eight opportunities for boys to do things. And if you want to be a girl one that gets to tag along, make yourself pretty. Make yourself adorable. Because the girl one is so adorable and she's wearing a big bow in her hair. So we know she's a girl one. But the boy ones don't have boy one written on their head. They're all just as assumed they're just boy one. And it really upsets me. And I went and had a look because I heard there was a new girl one and I heard that they'd had this complaint. She's also so white, Sky. I mean, it's really obvious. I mean, she's not because she's a dog, but she is. Um, And then there's a new one. Do you know what the new girl dog is called? Now, bear in mind, she's evil. She's, She's a baddie. The new girl dog is a baddie, gang. Do you know what her name is? No. That's a harsh heckle. I'm not evil, I'm feisty. 
a word reserved entirely for women with opinions. Um, she's feisty. Um, no, the evil dog, who has an even higher voice than Sky, is called Sweetie. Not making that up. Sweetie. How does it, what, if you were evil, would you give yourself the name Sweet? I just think you'd change it. She can't talk yet, this little girl. She's shaping her identity now. And this is the message she gets, but it's also the message that all the boys get. All the boys get a message, if you want to go out on an adventure and fix something, change something, change the world, what you need is a team of bros. And a woman, one on the end, to be pretty, to be attractive, to be adorable, to come along on the ride. So a woman is allowed along. And so when that little boy is then at school going, let's go on some adventures, or when he's doing his first ever piece of activism, or he's at uni and he's putting people forward for the student union, or he's creating his first startup, what message has he been given since he was born? What you need is a crew of bros. And if you let a woman one in, if you let a girl play along, she better have a pink bow and be a labradoodle, not literally. But that's what he's learned. And I just sometimes feel like it doesn't ever get any better. I'm a big consumer of film and television, you know, Netflix, and I love finding new stuff. We all love finding a new Netflix now. It's what we do to not be on Twitter for a bit. And because we can't not be on Twitter unless we're watching something and then we can kind of go, oh, we shouldn't double screen. Um, there must be at least one screen now at all times. It's awkward now that so some people are thinking, oh, I haven't checked my phone for a bit. Um, don't do um, And I think, you know the Bechdel test? We all know the Bechdel test. This is the DF Dubs test. This is my test, okay, that I want you to look out for now. Does the woman kill the story? If you listen to the woman, would there be no plot? Because that's what I see all the time. The story goes like this. There's a man getting his... It's a movie opens. There's a man getting his coat on, getting his hat on. And then a woman comes out and goes, Dan, where are you going? Why are you going back into the office now? You said you were retired. We had the retirement party last night. And then Dan goes, Oh, Muriel, there's just one more job I have to do. I just didn't close the case before I left. I'm just going back to the office just in case I can close the case. And she goes, but Dan, you said we were moving to Florida where nothing would ever happen to us ever again. <laughs> I know, but I just need to check. And then I promise we'll go to Florida where there will be no story. No, no plot, nothing will happen to us once we get to Florida. We will feel nothing and we will do nothing. <laughs> nothing will interfere with us just staring into space like you've always wanted it to be, Muriel. But Dan, I want to do it now. I have to go, Dan, it seems like when you walk out that door, you're walking into the second act without me. <laughs> and the second act is where things happen. You just stay back here in act one. You won't be needed again till act three, when you can do some crying. <laughs> I will be crying if anything happens. You, want, you, you know what I'm saying? The woman always wants to kill the story. In an American sitcom, the dad will be in the garden, like with a, on a trapeze. You know the sitcom I'm thinking of. And the mum will come out and go, what's this shit, Jeffrey?" And he'll go, I'm doing a trapeze for Joey's birthday. And she'll be like, well, I don't want anything happening near Joey. I don't want Joey seeing things happening. I want Joey's life to be free of plot. <laughs> and what's the shit with, what are these llamas here? Oh, I thought it would be good to have a petting zoo as well as circus skills. Well, then something will happen on the llama, near the llama, or to the llama. <laughs> And I don't want that kind of comedy potential <laughs> in my house or near my house. Well, right, but then it'll be all the more durable when the comedy happens, because you'll disapprove of it. That does seem to be my role here, yes. <laughs> all right, I'll cancel it. I'll just get Joey a birthday cake. Are you honestly telling me you're going to set fire to a cake indoors? I can't have Joey seeing action. I want nothing to happen in Joey's life until he dies. And even that will be too much plot for me. 
the Tom Cruise movie is the one movie that sort of, it just sort of tips, it just, there's a twist on it. In the Tom Cruise movie, there is a woman adjacent to Tom Cruise and she is saying, I know that you need to get in the really fast car and drive to the really fast plane and then pilot the really fast plane fast upside down and then land it to get to the legal case which you were going to win in at court <laughs> in order to prove that your dead father is <laughs> not better than you. <laughs> Every movie. <laughs> but I must advise in my professional opinion that you not do those things. Although... I do want to see them a little bit because I will be aroused by them. <laughs> so I will be adjacent and horny, mildly disapproving, <laughs> but pretty excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our first guest today is an activist who has been fighting underrepresentation of black people in the media while still at school. That's right, what have you been doing? <laughs> still at school, she's doing her A-levels. Please welcome Liv Francis Cornerbear. <laughs> Our second guest is a writer, broadcaster, and activist from Brisbane, Australia. Please welcome Yasmin Abdel Majid. <laughs> so, to introduce both our guests, Liv. Uh, you had a campaign which many of you here in London might have seen, or you may have seen it on the internet, with an organisation called Legally Black. Is that right? Tell me about Legally Black. It's myself and the three other activists from South London. So I may have misspoken when I said it was an organisation. Yeah, it's not. It was four, <laughs> four, four of you, and you're all at school? Yeah. And tell us what it's about. We were on an eight-month fellowship called the Advocacy Academy. And on the programme, at the end, you basically come up with a campaign based on the issue that you like, really care about. And it's a campaign that we created to tackle underrepresentation and misrepresentation of black people in the media. And so what was that campaign? Um, we subverted iconic film and TV posters such as Titanic, Harry Potter, Bridget Jones, James Bond, and we basically replaced the normal posters with black actors to like highlight and get people to kind of think about why they're not seeing Black, black actors in lead roles in UK films. And what's your log line on the poster? If you're surprised, it's because you're not seeing enough black actors in lead roles. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we'll, talk, <laughs> we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, Susie Wakoma, why was this campaign good for you? This campaign has been fantastic for my career. Um, <laughs> I'm really selfish. Um, well done on all the activist stuff, but thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Basically, what happened, when this campaign took place. Um, took place, a friend of mine, five friends of mine messaged me and said, oh my God, are you the new Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> because basically, one of the models that they got for the Doctor Who poster looks a lot like me. And so I'm hoping that, you know, the bosses will look at that and go, no, oh, that no. doesn't look... That, I'm, I'm looking at that and it doesn't make me feel sick. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. No well done. That's really... He's given her a big career boost. Thank you. And Yasmin, uh, you were meant to be in America right now, weren't you? I was. I was meant to be speaking at a conference, the Penn World Voices Festival. Ironically, at an event called No Country for Young Muslim Women and they didn't let me in. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? It's like, yeah. I mean, it's awful. It's awful. Literally, but no it's Do you think they were just trying to make a satirical point? I think the customs officer was just like, you know what? I've always wanted a comedy career, so I'm going to start now. So you actually flew to America? I flew to the United States, and I've been to the United States many times before to speak at many events on this particular visa. Side note, I was born in Sudan and, have, and go to Sudan quite regularly. Sudan was one of the lucky countries that made the Muslim ban list, initially anyway. 
sad face. They took Sudan off after a while and put Chad on, and I was like, sorry, Chad. Um, <laughs> but initially, when the Muslim ban came in, despite the fact that I had an Australian passport, it meant that I couldn't qualify for what they call an ESTA, which is this kind of visa waiver thing. Anyway, so rocked up to the customs officer, and I'm, I'm usually quite cool in a customs line, you know, I'm just like hanging out, got an earbud in. I try to not look scary, because like, the thing you don't want to look in a customs line as a black Muslim woman is scary, right? You right. try not to, like, no hurried movements, right? You don't want to look too much in your bag. You don't want to sweat. You've been on a flight for 10 hours, but you don't want to look sweaty, right? It's a whole vibe. Compression socks so your ankles aren't swelling, right? Because, like, that could be a sign of too much weight. I don't know. Um, and I get to the customs guy, and he's like, you're here to speak? I'm like, yep. And he's like, why aren't you on the Esther? And I say, look... I'm, you know, the whole Muslim ban thing, lols. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, um, we're just going to get you to go to secondary screening. And I'm like, <clears throat> this will be chill. You know, I'll just flirt with the customs officer and get through. Right, customs officer was a lady. <laughs> and not a fan of the Yasmin Abdul Majid wink, right? Like, I was like, how's it going? Wink, nothing. Um, <laughs> You were well, raised in Australia, weren't you? What, yeah, how old so were you when you went to I Australia? I was a year and a half when I moved to Australia. So, like, okay. fully Aussie, right? Yeah. I dropped sea bombs Like, that's how Aussie I am. <laughs> right? Sorry, Mum. <laughs> and essentially, within 10 or 15 minutes, they decided that I was to be returned. The lady was like, we're going to send you back. I was like, lols, you're deporting me. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, oh. I, I didn't realise that was a thing that happened. And she was like, yeah, please take a seat. And then I can't talk too much about the rest of what happened, um, essentially, because my lawyers are trying to get me back in. Um, but suffice to say, I can't get back into the United States at the moment. They cancelled my visas. I have to essentially pay, at the moment, my lawyers have advised it'll cost between seven to 10,000 pounds um, to get the visa to get me back into the United States. Um, and, you know... It's apparently, that's how the system works, right? Though I would argue the system, therefore, isn't really set up right. Uh, but that's... Yeah, I think we'd all think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. you're a young writer and broadcaster and person who was there for a conference, and they were just like, no, we're sending you back on random grounds. Essentially, their argument was that the visa that I was there on wasn't the right one, despite the fact that I'd been... Told in, you had to be on that one because of Sudan. Correct. And had been to the United States numerous times before on that exact same visa. And is right. Sudan, because Sudan's now off the list, and Chad, just to be clear, it's Chad the country, not just a guy called Chad. Because <laughs> yeah. when you said that, I thought, God, is it just like these five countries and, and you, Chad. this guy, <laughs> you, Chad. Do you know what? Just don't like your face. It's like, just me on my own. I'm not, not even a country. No, just you, Chad, are banned. It's Hashtag a- not all Chads. <laughs> Um, most chads are lovely yeah. blokes, you know. I've never met a chad. I mean, look, it's uh, a they're very... They're mostly American, to be fair. Yeah. Fair yeah, enough. They're mostly American. A, lo- a lot of them are men's rights activists. We've got to be honest about that. I was going to say, most I haven't really met a chad that I've really been into. And I like white boys. Like, it's a whole problem. Like... Is it a whole problem? <laughs> We've got to come back because that's what we're meant to take Your live is personal. Your face live right now is giving me <laughs> She's giving me eyes. Yeah. Yo, I grew up in Australia. I had no other choice. Right? Are you, are you, are you judging her for the white boy situation? <laughs> this is a little bit. This is. Oh, I am being bit. schooled right now. Oh my God. So, Liv, oh, tell us about your love life. No, that's not what we're here for. Although I am intrigued. I am intrigued. Oh, she said, please don't. Okay, there's a, there's a story there. The, the look of horror on Liv's face I'm right so now. Excited. Tell us in the green room. Tell us in the green room. Sorry. Just to be clear, Liv said, I can only come on this show if you pick me up at the library. Um, because she's doing her A-levels. So we're seriously wasting her revision time right now (laughs) with this shit. Um, So could you tell us more? So you do the Susie McComber lookalike on the Doctor Who poster. Uh, How did you get them up in the bus stops and on the tube and all of those places? Oh, that wasn't us. That wasn't you? Well, you just did the posters? (laughs) Yeah. And then what did you do with them? Like, did you put them online? Yeah, they were initially meant to be for our website and... um... Yeah, like, just, like, to share with the rest so of the So how did they get it. on bus stops? Because I definitely saw one on a bus stop. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, uh, a group called Special Patrol Group. Really, really... Paw Patrol? Like, <laughs> like the whole patrol thing. Paw Patrol. Nine. Sweetie, that was her job. Uh, uh, that's why she was the villain, because she put the black people's uh, posters maybe everywhere. Maybe Sky with, uh, maybe Sky Yo, with her jetpack. that pack. got deep. <laughs> I think... 
I think there's one Hispanic one. That's what I think. Because I remember Lynn Mama Miranda saying, go the Spanish dog. Uh, so, <laughs> seriously, it's not great. Uh, so, tokenism yeah, everywhere. I mean, where was Sudan, though? Like, I mean, this is always where a question. Where was Chad? <laughs> Fuck. Where? <laughs> oh, God. I want to know. Yeah. Um, I'm so going to create a mascot for the show called just a guy called Chad. <laughs> Just, just gonna sit he stands in the there. So who put them up on the bus stops? Um, special patrol group. As special a surprise patrol. to us for our graduation. Like, we literally woke up on Thursday, 1st of March, and one of the other members of the group, uh, Shaden, went to school, and a kid in, like, year eight came up to him and was like, are you going to be in the new Inbetweeners movie? And he was like, what? <laughs> and literally he goes with his friends to Brixton at lunchtime and sees himself on a bus stop and calls me up like Liv oh. posters are up I'm like no they're not he literally yeah. sends me pictures oh and there's like a there's a picture of me actually if you check the Instagram at Legally Black UK um, <laughs> I'm literally like next to a poster like at Brixton next to oh H&M my. like looking like guys that's me wow and were you on the poster yeah I'm on the Harry Potter one. Oh my god are you Hermione yeah oh my god <laughs> so you're and suddenly you're up. So how did they, did they pay for them to go up? Not as such. <laughs> sure, sure. How did they get them up? No comment. Right, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. You are so good, Liv. You are so good. You are so good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. yes. Um, so they were like a sneaky group of white hat bandits. Activists. Yeah. Activists, sorry. Hacktivists. Hacktivists. So some hacktivists basically got them up. And then there was a lot of media interest about it, wasn't there? Yeah. I saw it on Susie Bacoma's timeline. <clears throat> That's why you're here. Because um, I was like, oh my God, Susie's Doctor Who. Um, and then it turned out, no. Uh, Doctor no, Who? But, yeah. Have you had any positive feedback from it? Well, I'm here. So. Sure. Hey, <laughs> give it up. Yeah. Yes. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Uh, I've done an event with Galdem. We've been on Sky News, BBC Breakfast. Uh, I went to Manchester for the first time. Like, got the, yeah. Um, we've uh, wrote articles for Guardian, iNews, The Statesman. Wow. We've, um, this is great for the UCAS form, by the way, isn't it? Yeah, you're already, I already sent it off. You sent it off? No, Ready? get it yeah. back, get it back. It's get it phones. back. Oh. I, okay, I think back. I'm okay. I've got pretty good offers. Right, okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> she doesn't need it. Wow. She doesn't need it. <laughs> um, but you're going to be a little bit famous when you hit university as an activist. Have you had anything negative come from it? A few people like didn't understand what the campaign is about. And it's kind of like a bit annoying because I just read the articles. It explains it all. <laughs> yeah. It really yeah. says people don't though, they just read the top line or they just see a Well, they Doctor just see who the poster and, and they go, yeah. there was one guy who I oh, went to town on because I sometimes saw that. Some, did you see me? Yeah. I went. I just was like, you had our why are you being so stupid right now? He was like, this is horrible, and you're just erasing people. And this, it's like, no, it's literally just replacing, because it's, it's not the erasure of white people. Mm. It's just putting black people in the leads and going, this looks weird, right? It's literally just inverting it. And he just was like, well, it's, this is the beginning of Armageddon. It's like, oh, for <laughs> it's just, it's, But it's, it's not meant to say we don't <laughs> want... Matt Smith or no. uh, Jodie Whittaker, it's meant to say, God, if this looks odd to you, and that's why the logline is really good, if mm. it looks odd, why don't you ever see this? Why are they basically yeah. almost like, no examine shows? Examine why whiteness is the norm for you. Like, why are you so shocked? To see? Mm. If I could go back, I really would not, like, I think it was good for, for like the press, but Harry Potter, the amount of people who just couldn't get over the fact that like, I touched Harry Potter. Oh, but like, you're going to get that. You. That's a failure like, of their like, imagination. It's yeah. not your problem. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. And it is, so yeah. do you think you wouldn't do it again because it was too stressful? Mm, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but like, it was I, shocking how much... A lot of the backlash, I think, was just the fact that like, a lot of people couldn't get past... The, like, they didn't even look at the campaign. They were just like, you, you ruined Harry Potter. How mm. dare you? Yeah. Yeah. My Harry Potter knowledge is not good enough to... like reply to those trolls couldn't, oh, couldn't you don't like, listen I'm a massive I'm a huge Harry Potter fan I started reading the books when I was 10 mm. and um, fuck them don't worry about it <laughs> I'm with her I'm with her it would have been sick if Harry Potter was all black people or like Hermione had like a hijab I'd be like you know the bushy hair vibe you know she just like yeah. wrap that up 
Well, there was obvious, a black, like obvious solution. Mm. There is a black Hermione in the West Oh, yeah, and she's got exactly. it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she got, yeah. It's it horrible. must have been awful. It's it weird. Awful. It's well. But then J.K. Rowling said, well, it says that she's got brown curly hair or black curly hair in it, so that makes sense that she's black. And no one ever said she was white. Mm-hmm. Um, then but, everyone goes, but... <laughs> But white people, you never see white people described in books as white. You, people are only described if they're black or brown. Yeah, I have that actually. I think I talked about this. There was once I was doing a show and we had somebody come in to write the audio description script. So people who, if they're visually impaired, they have an earpiece where they can hear audio description of the actors. And I was pulled to one side by my director who was white um, said, I just want to tell you about this. Let me know if you're angry because I'm angry. Everybody in the cast who is white, their race is never mentioned, but yours is. And it just made me think, God, the idea of an actor, it's a given that they're white. And if you're not white, you need to be described. And I thought, God, how many times have I done a show, an audio descriptive um, performance, where that has happened? And probably every single time. They say, a black, a black lady, woman's come on. A black's come on, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> a black's come on, she's far away from you. <laughs> she has been fed. <laughs> she has been watered. Oh, now she's getting a little bit close. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for you and Legally Black? What do you think? DA levels first. Do you, have, do, you yeah. have, do you have any plans? Or haven't you cooked anything up yet? Or are you not allowed to say what you're doing next? Um, well, currently, like Susie said, A levels. Um, but we have had a meeting of Channel 4 commissioners and we're meeting them again after exams, July. Fancy. Woo-woo. Wow. Um, yeah, and I myself... I'm not really sure what our next plan is. Like, we need to, you know... Have a huddle after A-levels. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. But um, we definitely want to do more stuff. Like, Belle's really into environmentalism, sustainability. Um, Shaden is really into, like, black masculinity. And I really care about, like, misogynoir, which is the intersection of racism and sexism, for those of you who don't know, and post-colonial, like, theory. So, yeah. Your generation gives me so much hope. Oh, you're going to save us, I really I hope my generation leaves you a world, because I think we're going to fix it. Um. It's pretty impressive. identity it's always been a source of headache for me and my family actually I remember the first time we were trying to get into clubs me and my little sister trying to get into clubs trying to get into clubs I didn't really bother because it wasn't my bag I just knew I had a feeling that that sort of hyper hetero environment wasn't going to be fun but my little sister was keen and so um, I remember once rummaging through a bag because I did because I wanted to know her secrets and, um, and I once found them, um, I know, but I did find gold once. Once I found her fake ID and her name, I kid you not, this was the days of um, footballers' wives, and her fake name was Chardonnay Jones. <laughs> I remember finding the fake ID and just holding it up to the sky and then kissing it like, ah, that's going to be, I'm going to be using that for a while. <laughs> And then I remember another time I found out my brother, his first sort of major girlfriend, once they broke up, like they were dating for about a year and then they broke up and he was really sad. And I was like, dude, like, what happened? What was going on? And uh, he was just like, oh, man, like, like, all my days, like. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, my brother's showing emotion. Shit, okay. Talk to me, brother. And he went, like, she found out in the year that my name ain't Leon. <laughs> You lied about your fucking name <laughs> for a year. <laughs> it's just like when you're in the club, yeah, like, and these girls, are they like, they want your number in it. Sometimes you've got to use an alias. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> an alias. An alias. Anyway, that was hilarious. They actually broke up and they got back together and she dumped him um, after a little while. But I knew that identity was going to be a source of headache 
ever since I was at primary school because there was a war in my primary school. There was a war between who was the coolest blacks. And, uh, and it was split between the Jamaicans, or as my mum says, the Jamaicans, uh, or, the, or the Africans. And all the Jamaicans all said, oh, you Africans aren't, you lot ain't cool. You lot ain't cool. You're not cool like us. We came on the wind rush. And you lot just arrived uh, because that's what happened. Um, <laughs> and I know that loads of you lot are like, what? I watched Coachella last night. There's no such thing as an Uncle Black. And you're right. We're all really cool. <laughs> But back in Dare, there was a war. And I remember so many of my friends, they had like, a, one of my really good friends had a surname, a really, not a difficult um, West African Nigerian surname. But I remember she used to always try and change the pronunciation because she wanted to sound less African. And she'd be like, oh, my name, my surname is Adafraka Nonono. That would be her name. But she'd be like, it's Adafraka Nonono. And I was like, <laughs> that ain't your, ain't your fucking name. Why are you lying? <laughs> I like, but I get it, I get it. It was all about not wanting to be the more foreign outsider. It was, it was just about survival when we were kids. So you put it to one side. And I've always been really proud of my Nigerian heritage. I'd never been back as a kid, but I, I recently went back. But before then, I was just like, you know, I'm a Nigerian. I'd always identify as Nigerian. In fact, I would call myself a Nigerian Londoner because I felt like London was such... That was my identity. Rather than being British, being a Londoner, that felt truer to myself. A Nigerian Londoner, a Nigerian Londoner, Niger till I die, Nigeria till I die, Nigeria till I die. Then I went. (laughs) And there is nothing, fucking hell, there is nothing more heartbreaking than turning up to a country where everyone looks like you and you're proper foreign. Like, no one, you're not, you're not part of this. You're not part of this. The first thing that I realised, those are my friends who are from Lagos, Loads of my mates, they're like, oh my God, Lagos is where it's at. Have you seen Naomi Campbell and Skepta go there? And they're going there on holidays and it's just so fun. And all these like amazing artists are like hanging out in Lagos and it's so cool. It's so amazing now. Yeah, I'll tell you why it's amazing. When you're rich, my family are not rich, we're dirt poor. I remember when I came back, I was so upset and I was like, mum, I thought I was going to love Nigeria. I thought I was going to bloody love it, but it was really tough. She was like, yeah. Yeah, because we're poor. Like, we didn't have money. Why do you think I'm here? I was like... (laughs) So you left poverty in Nigeria to come to poverty in Peckham. P.S. Peckham used to be um, quite a rough area. It's not anymore, as you know, but it was rough when I was growing up. Some of you are like, Peckham's lovely. I live there. I've just bought a house. Um, It was shit... (laughs) It was a shithole when I was growing up, but I, I loved it, but it was a shithole. A lot of the people who were having a really, the best time in Nigeria were really, really rich. And I thought, gosh, I've come from one country where I felt utterly, utterly working class. I've gone over to here thinking like it's going to be coming to America, like everyone's going to be kings and queens. I was like, oh no, that's not, that's not for you. No, 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 no. You're poor here and you're poor there. You're like, oh shit, grand, brilliant. Some people are probably listening to this going, Suze, don't be so harsh on you. Don't be so harsh. Like, you need to just give it a go. Stop being so, mm, you're so westernised. Like, mm. But yeah, actually, Daniel Kaluuya, the actor in Get Out, he had an interview and he described it really well, where it's like, you feel like a forever nomad. You don't feel at home in the UK. You don't feel at home when you go back to the motherland. He's from Uganda and he says the same thing. And so I was feeling this and I was like, no, I just, no, I want to feel, let me in, let me in, let me in. And so I walked around, um, as I do, when people don't like me, it makes me desperate. And so I would walk around Nigeria and I go to this bar and I got introduced to these women. And I literally, I turned up and I do this a lot uh, when I'm nervous. I turned up and these women were all sat there and I went, hi, my name's Susan. Thumbs up. I did a thumbs up like that. <laughs> I did a thumbs up and they all just looked at me like, eh, what is this? What is this? <laughs> What is this child? What is it? And I was like, hello, so I've come from London, but my parents are, where are you from? Uh, my, uh, not here. Eh, they could smell the poverty off me. They're like, eh, okay, okay. And I thought, right, not only am I too poor, I'm not cool enough. I'm just literally not cool. All the things that I would think is pretty cool, they look at me and be like, and so, what is that? <laughs> so I felt poor and I felt really super uncool. Just kept doing a thumbs up. And then, um, <laughs> So, okay, so, yeah, people are going to be listening to this go, Suze, know your roots, man. Get used to your roots. Stop rejecting your roots. You are Nigerian whether you like it or not. Let me tell you something. Nigeria didn't want me there. Nigeria, the actual country, the actual country was like, get out. And let me tell you why. 
First time I went to Nigeria, I got hepatitis A. And you get that from contaminated water. So I turned up like, mm, go, 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 this is my country, this is my country. And it went, no, fuck it isn't. It's ain't your country. So I got hepatitis A. Next time I went there, my second trip, I turned up and I was like, right, hepatitis A, if you don't know, once you get it, you're immune. So I was like, Go, 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 I got food poisoning. I was like, this, this country does not, it doesn't want me, but I shall persevere. I will persevere. And then uh, one day I, I get bitten quite a lot. I get bitten by mosquitoes quite a lot. It's really annoying. And, uh, and then one day I woke up and, uh, and I was like, just look at my legs. My legs are in the sun. I'm getting that vitamin D. The sun is my skin. It's what it needs. I looked down on my fucking legs and I had five bites on this leg. They were huge, huge. And then a massive one in this angle, ankle. And I couldn't walk. I literally got up and I was like, oh, God, oh, wow, what has got me? And I could just hear Nigeria going, <laughs> this is not your land. <laughs> and so I thought, no, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. So uh, I went out and I, uh, and I uh, saw the really unfriendly Nigerian women um, earlier who I gave the thumbs up to, who already hate me. And, uh, and I turned up and I went, um, hi, um, hi, oh, sorry, uh, and thumbs up. Uh, I don't, um, I just wonder, I just wonder, because I thought they've seen everything. They've seen everything. So I went, so, I'm really sorry. Um, I just wondering, what, what would you, what would you call these, uh, what would you call these bites? What would you go? And all of them went, Jesus Christ! I don't know what those bites are. You need to go to the hospital. You need to go to work. You, you know you're fucked. When the locals, when the locals are going, I know about that shit. I ain't seen that shit. So it was really, <laughs> It was, a te it was awful because I felt not only all the emotional kind of baggage that you get when you're like, God, I don't fit in. My physical body was not settling in this place. And it was heartbreaking. And then, so by the time I came back, yes, there is very <laughs> covert systemic racism that I have to battle through. But I did come back and I thought, okay, you know what? I've got to make my peace with my identity. And so I called my mum up, which was one of my challenges for today. I called my mum up and I was like, right, okay, well, let's talk about this. I want you to talk me through my identity and my tribe and who am I? Who, who am I? Uh, I made that call to my mum, left a message. I was like, I want to I dig into this. Let's talk about this. Who am I? She hasn't called me back. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Yasmin... How's uh, it going? Yeah, it's, it's going all right, Yasmin. Yasmin and I are both Brisbane girls, <laughs> but I've been here longer. Um, I'm basically Muriel for Muriel's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel when you were actually... Could you believe it when you were sent on the plane back? So, honestly, the whole time I was, like, super chill because the way that I process weirdly traumatic experiences is to pretend I'm in a film, right? right like, I'm just like, oh, yeah... This is a movie. Let me just create a soundtrack. So I spent most of the time on Spotify. <laughs> and then you? I painted my nails, like legit. <laughs> and then I read the book in my bag called Algorithms of Oppression. Weirdly uh, ironic. Did you cry? I mean, not at the time. And I think the way... So I've, I've had quite a traumatic... Mm, quite an intense sort of 12 to 15 months. Um, and so this was just kind of like the icing on the shit cake. And so it was like kind of tasty in a way because I was like it is a great story like despite the fact yes it's going to be super expensive like it's ruined my plans for the rest of the year however but on the upside this is how women of colour have to live it's sort of yeah. like it's ruined yeah. my plans for the yeah. whole year yeah. but I'm not going to be able to <laughs> what a dinner party story <laughs> for real Just though so fucking <laughs> like I mean so and also sidebar born in Sudan when I tell my parents about things like this they're like at least you're not being tortured like <laughs> oh they must be annoying parents though oh my god literally <laughs> oh, literally oh, my, da my, my dad is like oh the government at, <laughs> at least you're allowed to say things like if this was Sudan you'd be arrested and we'd all be being tortured and I'm like so as a kid if you wanted like a Barbie dream house oh no no he'd no. be like 
You, you know Don't what you're getting for Christmas? <laughs> you're not being tortured. <laughs> literally, like, I'm, I, I'm not even like, it's not, this is not hyperbole. My dad literally said, well, at least you're not being tortured. Or you could be being sent to Guantanamo, so, you know, count your blessings kind of vibe. Wow. I, I mean, it's have... true. Oh my can, God. I, <laughs> can I just do a pick up there with the more culturally sensitive Eid? Because I just said Christmas. So we're going to edit this in. <laughs> so when you. I love so that. Honest. That's so chill. This is what, this is what so, white people have to go through. You're like, <laughs> edit, censor. Feel, um, whereas I'm like, fuck this, fuck that, fuck this, fuck that. <laughs> feel, feel my pain. <laughs> feel my pain. <laughs> if I'm not checking my phone, I'm checking my privilege. I'm telling that right now. Hey! <laughs> and the rest of us are out here checking our visas. <laughs> The rest of us are out here checking our visas. <laughs> oh, it's true. I'm sorry, I missed that joke and it was so good. It was so good. good. Anyway, so if you... I'm going to try and make this unnatural. <clears throat> so when you're a kid, if you wanted a Barbie dream house, your father would say... <laughs> your father yes, would say, <laughs> not being tortured, that's what you're getting for Eid. Hey. <laughs> to be fair. You meant to do a medium-sized jungle. <laughs> God. Um, it's going to sound sarcastic now. Uh, so, yes, relative, you know, privilege. They didn't send you to Guantanamo, but very real way, you're meant to be at a conference advancing your career and engaging with other women and yeah. doing something interesting I mean, and good. And in fact, yeah. you're back here and have $7,000 to $10,000 before pounds. Pounds, pounds, seven, pounds yeah. Shit. It's like, I don't have that kind of money, essentially. So, essentially, the... It's can we kind of, raise it? Like, can we do a sort of uh, a just giving and see if the listeners I mean, will I help I feel us? bad. Like, okay, so I'll tell you what my reticence around this kind of thing is. Is I grew up, my family sort of moved to Australia and we were sort of very proud and we didn't have to take money from anyone. My parents haven't given me money since I was 16 years old and I've been able to pay my way and live a lifestyle that I really enjoy. I live in, you know, Shoreditch and I drink oat milk, right? So <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Who are you? I know, I know. My friends may call me Priscilla behind my back. Right. Liv just wanted to chip in there. What were you going to say? Me too. I'm lactose intolerant. Oh, girl. The struggle is real, though. Nobody warns you, right? You just like, it's because I'm black. I I have lactose privilege. (laughs) She out here drinking full cream milk. Like, she she just likes... I have... My system is just like... Bring it on. (laughs) Sorry, continue. Girl. Yo. Yo. Um, so you drink oat milk, sure. Yeah, but so I guess it would help a lot. Yes. However, I flag that it's something that I feel uncomfortable doing. Also, because when uh, women sort of take money or ask for money, it's always seen in a particular. Like a man can go out and be like, "I want to raise ten million dollars for my thing," and no one will blink an eyelid. But women don't get given money very often, and the way that it's looked at when women ask for money and women ask for support it is very different. So I guess I just, I say all of that. And I got deported last week, essentially. So I've been back in the country, maybe like, less than a week. So it's still been still yeah, quite, still quite fresh. fresh, right? Mm. And it, like, totally blew up in the press, obviously, because there were, like, Muslim activists, Sudanese-Australian Muslim activist who is speaking at an event called No Country for Young Muslim Women sure. gets denied entry into the US, right? It's, um, it's an Onion article. <laughs> 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 but not, it's my life. Um, <laughs> And so I guess the way that I tend to deal with things like this is to try to find ways to make it survivable. You can't really live in Australia anymore, can you? Or, or you move? Oh yeah. So of... yeah, th- that's that's the other funny thing. Um, so in Australia, last year, around this time, actually just around this time last year, we have a day called Anzac Day, uh, which is kind of like our version of Remembrance Day. It's on April twenty fifth, and uh, like I woke up on the day. It was a regular day, and I was like, oh, you know, the phrase that's often used on Anzac Day is "less we forget," right? Lest we forget, and it talks specifically, people in that conversation are talking about Gallipoli, which was this particular battle in World War I. I don't remember Gallipoli, wasn't there, don't have any relatives who were there. But obviously, you know, feel strongly about wanting to commemorate the day. So I wrote on my Facebook page, lest we forget, and then brackets, I thought, what else should we not forget? So then I wrote four words, Manus, Nauru, Palestine and Syria. Now, Manus and Nauru are the prison camps, essentially, that we held asylum seekers on. 
People they're very, very brutal, and there's been like, lots of terrible stories. People have been killed, and it's essentially, been... some guy set himself on fire to protest how bad they were. Right? Amnesty International has called it a man-made humanitarian crisis. It's awful. It's being done in our name using our taxpayer money, um, and obviously, Palestine and Syria are things that we should also not be forgetting. I put that up. Didn't think it would be that controversial, and you would think that, like, I had decided to join ISIS. Like the level of backlash. The kinds of things that were said about me and the kinds of things that happened to me are so ridiculous that it feels stupid saying. Like, it feels ridiculous to even say. So I'd actually also, because I switched my phone off, funnily enough, it was a public holiday, I was like, oh, I put that up, I'm going to do some writing. And then a friend of mine about an hour later was like, hey, Yasmin, that was a really offensive post, you should take it down. I was like, it's not offensive, nobody's going to be offended. He was like, no, you should really take it down. So I took it down and I said, I apologise for any offence that may have caused, that was not my intention. And I kind of said... Lols, wouldn't it be funny if somebody noticed it was up? And then I took a nap, and it was the last nap that I ever took, right? Because I woke up, and it was on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, I think, or whichever tabloid is in Australia, kind of like, un-Australian activist denigrates the diggers, or, you know... The diggers are the Australian soldiers. The diggers are the Australian soldiers. And it unleashed, so within a couple of weeks... Over 100,000 words were written about me in the press, and somebody did a calculation on this. The Prime Minister commented on it. I was getting phone calls from the Foreign Minister being like, you need to stop talking about this sort of stuff in public. I was debated in Senate estimates. I got more death threats that I could count. Essentially, I lost all of my work, so I had a very casual job on the ABC, which is our version of the BBC. All of the campaigns and speaking events I was at was cancelled because there was too much backlash. They started sending reporters to my, any of my events with school children, with anyone. Um, there, were fo- there were posters with my face, like racist posters put around cities. But you didn't say anything. You just said, lest we forget, I, that presumably includes mm-hmm. World War I. Yep. And then, in brackets, here are some other things we should remember that are more current. Oh, but you see, what that implied was that I was <laughs> ungrateful. Why should you be grateful? You're well, Australian. Trust You've got an Australian me. Australian passport. I don't know, because here's the thing, and this is this is what I learned from that, right? Like, I should also preface that by saying, like, two or three years ago, I was young Australian of the year for my state. I started a youth organisation when I was 16. I graduated first class honours from mechanical engineering. I got more awards than I could crap out. I like literally was on so many boards in. Ca- I, could not remember the number of boards and councils that I volunteered on. So I could not have been more a model minority. Like, they want wow. the perfect brown Muslim woman. They got it. But then they didn't realise that that brown Muslim woman had opinions. Or that that brown Muslim woman might say something that was a little bit confronting. And the moment that, that she did, they completely flipped. Completely. And for months... For li- I moved house, I changed my phone number, I couldn't earn anything. The engineering company that I worked for, I, so I was a mechanical engineer, I worked on oil and gas rigs, I did a bloody good job, I was a top-ranked drilling engineer in my region, right? The engineering company leaked that I was forced to resign because I was a liability, which was a lie. And then when I went back to that engineering company and said, please correct the record, they said, we can't help what the report is right. So not only was my personal reputation and my personal safety completely slashed. My engineering reputation in the financial presses was slashed. And they all turned around. Every single company that I worked for, every single organisation that I served with, do you think any of them stood out, went on television and defended me? Do you think any of them said, you know what, this is actually a bit ridiculous? The people that did defend me were the writers and the creatives and the people of colour. And I'm so grateful for that. But the people with institutional power, they were nowhere to be seen. And so people tell me that I should have faith in the system, that things will work, that you should just work hard enough. Bullshit. I worked harder than anyone ever could. I was 16 when I started a youth organisation. I was 24 when I published my first book with Penguin Random House. I got the best marks that you could. All across my... Every part of my academic career. What more does it take... To be Australian enough, to be accepted. It does, you, what it taught me was that it's not me that has to change, but it's the damn system, because it is not built. And then when I go to talk about it somewhere, they refuse me at the border. So what does that wow, tell what me? What do you do? What does that tell me? In 18 months, my visa here will be expired. What do I do? Do I go back to Australia where you know they will... Not be able to handle me. 
Well, if there's anybody listening who would like to sponsor Yasmin to stay in the UK, <laughs> I feel like we would be very happy to... If there's a chat very, that wants very, to get married, hello. <laughs> We'd be very lucky to have you. And I, I'm so happy you came on and told that story because it's, it's pretty shocking. It's pretty shocking. But this sort of far-right feeling that's coming around the world, you know, I know not everyone voted for Brexit for racist reasons, but it has had a racist impact and a marginalising impact. And a lot of the impetus was coming from keep them out, the build a wall thing in America, this reaction in Australia. We've basically empathetic people who realise that melanin in the skin is just melanin in the skin, we have to get busier and have more get up and go than the people who want to instil hatred and fear. We've got to get busier and we've got to get kinder. And a lot of it isn't just sort of protesting. It's how can you be proactively kind? How can you include? How can you make friends with people who don't look like you? How can you make friends with a refugee? How can you connect with people who are not in your circle and proactively include and feature more women of colour, more people of colour, more people from the LGBTQ community, more disabled people? How can we include, shine a light, be kind, be empathetic? Because when you hear stories, stories are the, the thing that will change the world more than anything else. Dickens did more for social mobility and empathy in this country than Marx. Because people read about a little boy called Oliver and cleverly Dickens said, oh, he was a little rich boy and he fell into the system. And then all rich people went, oh, this could be my child. Well, if it could be a rich child, oh, maybe it's not so great it happens to a poor child. We need to tell more stories. And we need to have stories be told. Do something, blog, podcast. Invite people around to meet your parents and your grandparents. Like, create a kinder world. We've got to have more get up and go than the people who hate. We have to now. Does anybody have a question for uh, Liv or Yasmin or any of us? Anybody I will accept, how are you so fly? <laughs> <laughs> so if we've got nothing else, how are you so fine? Thank you, Selinsky. The patriarchy will bring you a microphone and give you voice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yasmin, I'm Australian, so I'm so excited to see you here because I have obviously followed that... Um, that tweet, all that stuff that happened. Did in the you press. also have to leave because of a tweet? I didn't, um, but I did leave because I didn't want to have to be identified as an Italian Australian anymore. It's just Australian Italian have girls a, yeah. have to behave a certain way, <laughs> and it's a bit shit. Listen, and there are some amazing people in Australia and cities in Australia as well. And I do want to say there are some wonderful things about Australia, but this is a reality. And Australians, if you're listening, we also have Brexit, so <laughs> I'll stop and, bashing us. Yeah, um, but I just. Um, wanted to ask, how, how did you manage to get through all that? Yeah. Other than creating a Spotify playlist, of course. <laughs> I actually do have a Spotify playlist. I will share it later. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Look, essentially, I, I was like 25 when everything kicked off. And so I knew nobody that had gone through anything similar. All the professional advice kind of didn't work. All the professional advice was to stay quiet and just to, you know, go on living your life. I think what I learned in terms of figuring out how to deal with it was, A, get a therapist, 100%. That was probably... It took me about two months to get into it to get a therapist, and that was probably the first step in helping kind of on the journey. The second thing was essentially building a bit of an advisory board. People who knew more than me or who either understood the media or who just cared about me or had kind of reach in a particular way. And it was just a small group of people, but essentially whenever something really bad happened, I could just send them an email and be like, help, this particular thing has happened. And then became really, like, I'm really ruthless with my social media. If I even think you're vaguely going to be a troll, I will mute you. The mute words list that I have is enormous, right? Every type of possible insult that you could send me, I won't see it. Right? I gave away my phone for ages to somebody else because every time I logged onto Twitter or my inbox or any type of media 
or looked at a paper because my face was the front of the paper, I would be sad, right? And so I had to literally isolate myself from all forms of media because I knew that if I took it in, it would damage me. And then I moved countries. I genuinely do not think I would have survived if I stayed in Australia because it was so toxic and they were so obsessed and they still write about my tweets and they still write about what's going on and I don't live there and I haven't lived there for almost seven months. Also, what you said, what I can't get over is what you said wasn't bad. You said, lest we forget, and then in brackets, here are some other things we should not forget. It was because I said it. Yeah, right? sure. So like, if a white person had said that, oh, people would have gone, you're so woke system. No, 100%. Yeah. Like, let's not kid ourselves here. I'm a Muslim woman of colour who's a migrant to Australia. Someone like me should be grateful for my entire life. Yeah. My children should be grateful. My great, great, great grandchildren, if I ever choose to have children, should be grateful yeah. for the fact that they get the opportunities. Lest they forget that they don't own that land to begin with, mm. right? That they colonised it 200 and something years ago. You bring that up, people cannot handle that either and the amazing thing is people are always like Yasmin you just keep bringing up like race and who you are and you know all of these things uh, just we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll like, like, chill it. out and I'm like man I am chill but y'all have a problem right <laughs> y'all need to look at yourselves when I tell the story to people overseas, they can't believe it. Yeah, I find it really yeah, astounding. But then when you, really astounding. when you have conversations with senior people, you can have a conversation with someone on an ASX 100 board in Australia and they'll be like, yeah, well, you know, she shouldn't have gone there. She shouldn't have gone there. What did you say the foreign, sec was it the foreign secretary said? Uh, the, oh, foreign minister. The, the immigration minister. <clears throat> <laughs> Who's the immigration minister? Uh, the gorgeous Peter Dutton. What a babe. Um, who's <laughs> responsible for so much. Uh, when I lost my job on the ABC, again, the equivalent of the BBC, said one down, many to go. Do we have another question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I got what you said when you said that when men ask for money, they ask for millions and they get it and it's looked at in a different way to when women ask for money. Um, but Deborah also said that we should all do something and that we should make a difference in our own ways. So can we start a crowdfunder then? And can we That's make a lovely a question. In our own <laughs> yeah. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I think we should. It's not your fault you're going to be seven to ten grand in the hole. So I think lots and lots of people would chip in. I know that you feel like, oh, I should earn my own money because I drink oat milk, but... <laughs> You also, know, I if I've everyone got, chips in one pound, you know. And also, I've got to say, there is such a... Exactly what you said about, you know, the fact that you've never borrowed money from your parents. And, and, and I have that as well. There's a tremendous kind of pride. My parents never wanted to claim anything that they were entitled to in this country because they felt like that was wrong. But I feel like there is real strength in asking for help. You don't have to ask mm. it. You've already... You've put it out there and you said that you want to... You get started on it. And I think just let people do good mm. and let kind people do kind things. And it's because, also showing them... You have an army. It's not about the money. It's showing you have an army, and that's what we need. Thank you. Um, so we'll get a Kickstarter. We'll get a Kickstarter. We had one for Yusuf and Amina, and it got to... We hit the target, and then Yusuf said, oh, you have to close it down now. And I said, well, it's still got 28 days. This is the Iraqi immigrants who are in Austria that we were working with, and still are. And it got to the 10,000 euros, which is what they needed in order to be able to visit um, the little boys, to be able to visit their mum and all of that. And then uh, he said, oh, well, no, it's gone over now. It's 11,000, so you have to close it down. I said, well, I'll just leave it open because, you know, people might donate more. He said, no, but then you should give that to somebody else. He said, other people need money. And there are other people. And I was like, why is it always people, like they're refugees and the, have the worst things you can imagine have happened to them. Why is it always the people who do actually need or do, who go, oh no, it's fine. Can you imagine, like, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg going, oh, you should give that to some other website now. Um, <laughs> we don't need it. Oh my God, that, I'm, that, every time I'm just going to be like, what would Mark Zuckerberg do? Yeah, yeah exactly. He'd take it. We'd have a quick starter. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Like, from and, the bottom of my heart. And, before you write in, men, we know that not every time you ask for £10 million do you immediately get it. <laughs> but Sometimes nearly all weeks. the people who ask for £10 million funding are men, and nearly all the ones who get it are men. So that is true. I'm not saying you personally have £10 million <laughs> that was given to you because you asked someone at a bus stop. <laughs> Hashtag not all bus stops. Um, Hello.
Hello, Guilty Feminists. Just before the end of the show, I wanted to say that we are setting up something for Yasmin. Some kind person has offered to pay for some of her legal fees, but as she doesn't really have the money to pay for the rest of them, and our live studio audience so kindly volunteered to chip in, we thought we would set up a funding page. It's not set up yet, but if you go to guiltyfeminist.com in the next couple of days, you'll be able to chip in. And I really do want Yasmin to feel she has an army and really for the patriarchy to see that Yasmin has an army and we won't leave her hanging even if she does drink oat milk. In addition, if you would like to get tickets for the Guilty Feminist Presents Comics for Calais, a fundraiser for Help Refugees, and see our Skype link up to Calais, I will be in Calais. I will be waving to you. I will be doing some hosting from Calais right into Islington. Also, Sarah Pascoe, Ashling B, Susan McComa will all be in Calais with some other amazing comedians. And in uh, London, there will be Jessica Foster Q, Desiree Birch, Cindy V, Phil Jupiter's, and more comedians being announced, including, and I need to tell you this excitingly, some of the cast of Suffragettan will be there performing numbers from Suffragettan, which is an exciting reason to go to Comics for Calais in itself. Also, the wonderful Ali McGregor, who sang at the Palladium. So it's going to be a really, really, really uplifting night. Please get tickets now. Every penny will go to help refugees to a really wonderful cause and only £15. So please go to unionchapel.org.uk where you will find the show or guiltyfeminist.com. Also, if you keep listening after the closing titles, you know we normally have an extra gag. But today we have an amazing audience member who has a brand of T-shirts called She Shirts, which have amazing feminist slogans on them. But also all the money goes to wonderful feminist causes. So please keep listening after the end of the titles and you'll hear all about that. Have a very feminist week. And don't forget, if you're in London, book for the Union Chapel. Have you got anything to plug, Liv? Anywhere you'd like us to go? Any website? Oh, um, Legally Black UK uh, on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, legallyblack.space is the website. Dot space. Of course yeah. you do. I didn't even know there was a dot space. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and do you have anything to plug, Yasmin? I've got a little web series coming out called Hijabistas that you can keep an eye out for. It's coming out on the 1st of May. It's on hijabi fashion, or you can check out my website, Yasmin, A-M-Y-A-S-S-M-I-N-A-M. Wow, I forgot. <laughs> we'll find it. We'll find it. You're fabulous. Yeah. Um, um, and also, I've just opened mentoring. I want to mentor a couple of young people under the age oh. of 30, kind of like pay it forward. So if you're a young person under the age of 30 or you know a young person who you think could just use a little bit of guidance. Um, Take or me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 